it's time to start. We have some very special guests today, and I'm just going to let them introduce themselves. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the Reformation. Thank you for Martin. Thank you for Kate. Um, thank you that they're with us today. So bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. We are here this morning as Martin and Katie Luther. I'm Martin. And Katie. Uh, our focus is actually on Katie, the relationship that he had, she had with Martin Luther, as well as uh, the impact on their marriage, the Reformation impact on their marriage. The Luthers lived a very, very public life, but we will focus on the more personal issues in their life. Again, this dialogue is not about Katie's impact on the Reformation. That's for another time, but uh, more, personal, more personal information. Uh, our thanks this morning to Pastor Bill for this uh, invitation. Uh, we're only hoping that he doesn't regret it. <laughs> our thanks as well to Sue Weaver, who will be narrating. Now, in order to ensure the accuracy for what we're wearing, we did a great amount of deep research, and we drew upon these contemporary works of art. But to authenticate the bobblehead, we did select uh, paintings, personal paintings of Martin Luther and Katie. Martin wore the habit and hat of the Augustinian order. Martin's scarf was handmade based on contemporary portraits. Here's a picture of Martin's robe in Wittenberg Museum. It may be standing up by itself because they seldom, if ever, wash their outer garments. Katie is often shown with this headdress. Head coverings are women's most attractive and honorable and most genuine and most necessary head garment. Thank you for that. The outer garment is a peasant's dress, ordered from a source that makes reproductions. There's no stigma because 90% of the people were peasants. 10% were upper class. There was no middle class. The purse was functional since pockets had not yet been invented. Please note an alleged version of her purse in this painting that was featured in last month's Living Lutheran. I had good reason to have a sturdy purse, since I handled all the money. <laughs> Financial management was not Martin's forte. In the painting, however, we see an exaggerated purse on a sturdy rope. This is apparently a caricature of Katie's purse. The artist could be satirizing her masculine role to lightly criticize Luther. Katie later had to withstand much greater abuse. We now take you to a small town in Upper Saxony, 1517. Prior to the Reformation, Wittenberg was just a little village on top of a white sand dune, hence the name Wittenberg, or White Town, or White Sand Town. More significant than fashions and geography, is the accuracy of the resource material we used. I discovered Martin, or Katie, Katrina, and Martin Luther by Michelle de Rusha, which was published just this year, earlier. It became our primary resource. There are 40 pages of credible appendix, bibliography, and footnotes. Our dialogue is based on Luther's own works from his works. We use some paraphrase and transitional words, but it is as close to average as we can make it. Please consider this presentation a series of vignettes, a number of individual scenes. We discovered that many works drew on traditions which were inaccurate, or words that were the products of imagination. For example, take a look at this modern day picture of Katie. The painting shows how history can be distorted. 
She is portrayed as a wealthy noble person. The dress is no longer a peasant's dress, but a silk one fit for nobility. See her decorated hat, elaborate embroidery, and abundance of jewelry. Katie, you wouldn't even recognize yourself in this picture. <laughs> On the other hand, both Martin and I had one extravagant speech. Working with Jonas Cronach, Martin designed Katie's wedding ring. It featured a ruby, a symbol of extravagant love. The figures on the ring depict Christ's crucifixion. Their names and June 13, 1525 are engraved inside. Incredibly, you can see Katie's wedding ring at the museum in Leipzig. Katie designed Martin's ring. Martin's wedding ring, as in these replicas, was less elaborate. The ring which is lost stated, What God has joined, let no man put asunder. We celebrate Katie's contribution and her happy marriage. But to complete the picture, we need to understand that she was vilified as the wife in an illegal marriage. Representatives of Duke George wrote to Luther and called Katie his unmarried wife. Duke George's judge wrote that Katie led nuns astray and abused evangelical freedom through her lustful sin. And Luther wrote back, How dare you condemn a godly woman as though she were a whore gone astray? Where have you, judge, impudent young brat? Learn to defame the virtue of other people. Katie contributed to the Reformation, especially in terms of marriage and family. But first, a word about marriage in the early 1500s. The state of marriage was deplorable. Marriage was a sacrament, and yet there were few weddings that took place in the church. So how did the majority get married? A couple, him or her, simply said, let's get married, and then consummated the marriage. Probably not surprising that some used, let's get married, loosely. <laughs> Many a maiden was led astray and then deserted, and often pregnant. Look the woman. Consequently, there were claims of marriage or no marriage at all. Dispute over a child's father was common. The church came to the rescue. But according to Luther, it was primarily to make money. The church mediated for a healthy fee. Martin Luther determined to fix that system. There was also an alternate way to guarantee that the marriage took place. This practice focused on the wedding night. Are you with me? Yeah, yeah. Along with the newlyweds, a witness, for example, parent or pastor, gathered in the wedding chamber and witnessed the consummation of the marriage. <laughs> the witness guaranteed that the marriage was consummated, although it, it does seem a little invasive. <laughs> Luther's reforms had an immediate impact. He insisted on parental consent and the following procedure. If you want to get married, meet with the pastor. Then announce the engagement. Then remain celibate until married. And finally have a church wedding. In this way, no one could dispute the marriage if God, the pastor, and the congregation were witnesses to the ceremony. No witnesses were required on their wedding night. <laughs> and besides, the church lost most of their business in mediating marriages. Now we turn to my early life. I, Katerina von Bora, was born in January of 1499. I was descended from nobility. The bond in my name indicates the upper class. When I was five years old, my mother died. Within a year, my father married a widow with several children. Father, Hans.
once on Bora, owned a small parcel of land, but it did not produce enough for our larger family. Something had to give. It is likely my stepmother had a strong influence to put me in a convent. So her father took Katie in a horse-drawn wagon over 100 miles from home to a Benedictine convent. Now, it was common to place young girls or daughters in cloisters or religious schools, but usually only temporarily. And yet, during her four years in the Benedictine convent, she studied writing, reading, Latin, German, arithmetic, and religion, as well as morals and manners. When Katie was 10 years old, her father had her moved to another convent in Nipschen, 42 miles south. He paid the minimum amount for his daughter to live at the convent for the rest of her life. She had no choice. The decision was made for her. Most scholars believe her father had her transferred because it was cheaper to become a nun than to marry a man of nobility. She would have been expected to bring a substantial dowry, but there was none to offer. I continued my education in German, Latin, mathematics, church law, and prepared for consecration. At age 16, I took the vows of obedience, chastity, and poverty. My daily chores included housekeeping, food preparation, and gardening. Other responsibilities were nursing, and as treasurer of the convent's farms and estates. I had two aunts at the Nipshin convent, one an abbess and the other a nun. I believed I would never leave the convent. Instead, all that training prepared me for a life with a certain popular man of the day. Don't you think, Martin? <laughs> Our departure from Nixon will go down as the great escape. Thank goodness your writings were smuggled in. You're welcome. <laughs> your tra tract, Freedom of a Christian, made sense because some of us felt like prisoners. The grace that you spoke about came from faith alone, according to the Apostle Paul. A life of prayer and good works was not necessary for salvation. We were surprised that you responded to my letter and sent Herr Cope to help with our escape. We were expecting a horse and buggy but a fish wagon served just as well. <laughs> <laughs> On Easter Eve in 1523, 12 nuns chose to flee Marianthran, and there was a reason for the timing. It was the one night of the year when their worship deviated from the regular routine, and the nuns stayed up much later. Katharina and her peers hoped the abbess and other nuns would not notice any late night when the signal was given, the nuns fled their rooms with only the clothes they were wearing. We huddled together under a tarp in the same wagon Herr Pope used to carry Harry and other goods to and from the convent. Some had said we escaped inside the fish barrels, but it was the wagon which was fishy enough. <laughs> we were thrilled to make our way to freedom but at the same time frightened because escape was a punishable offense. We also feared for Herr Cope, who could lose his head over this crime. Thankfully, we made our way into Torgal to the sound of bells ringing on Easter morning. The following day, Easter Monday, the nuns traveled to Wittenberg, where it was safe under Frederick the Wise, and to meet their benefactor, Martin Luther. A few days after their arrival, 
The responsibility for nine single women set in. Luther was faced with providing food, clothing, shelter, and husbands for them. Three found refuge with their families. A student from Wittenberg wrote in a letter from that day, a wagon load of vestal virgins has just come to town. <laughs> All the more eager for marriage than for life. God grant their, them husbands, lest worse befall. I knew the nuns were getting older. And as you know, medical do doctors, medical science, has determined that the older a woman gets, the more sensuous she is. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was the medical doctor. <laughs> that may be the worst that may befall. Unless an unmarried woman could get a domestic job, she often ended up on the street. Nonetheless, it worked well for all of us. The nuns were married in a timely fashion except for you know who. My Lord Katie, we've lived an eventful life. I did not intend to get married. Daily I expected the death due a heretic. But I'm pleased to have married you. I admit that I was more interested in your friend Eva Schoenfeld from the convent. She was very nice and went quickly. <laughs>
We had six children in eight and a half years. <laughs> Johannes Luther, known as Hans, was the first born, just short of our first anniversary. Elizabeth was born during a plague. She died at eight months. Magdalena came less than a year later, and she died at 13 years. Then came Martin, then Paul, and Marguerite was born last. There were at least 11 foster children living in the Luther home as well. They came from relatives of both Martin and Katie. We delighted in our children and truly enjoyed them. Uh, we approached child raising as a holy calling. And you are a woman, and your work is pleasing to God. Motherhood is noble, godly work. If you were not a woman, you should be. <laughs> Many evenings, the family and guests would gather in the dining room. You played the lute, and the children sang. Every Christmas Eve, the family sang, From heaven above to earth I come. The hymn you composed for our children. Well, religious education in the home is vital. What does this mean? This means I needed to write a small catechism. <laughs> when the children got up in the morning, we said the Ten Commandments, the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and then a song. Yes, and when the children were older, they read a few verses from the Bible before every meal. Our home was the former Augustinian Monastery, known as the Black Cloister. It was given to Dr. Luther by the elector Frederick the Wise. We called it God's Inn. There were 40 rooms, and often all were filled with family, student boarders, visitors, and friends. The Luther living quarters have all been restored, including the living room shown here. This is also where the table talks were recorded. With all the talk at that table, Katie often grew impatient. She was trying to get everyone fed. She would sometimes join the men, but did not excuse going on and on. This was recorded in table talks. Doctor, why don't you stop talking and eat? I wish women would repeat the Lord's Prayer before opening their mouths. <laughs> but one should praise them, whether it's true or false. Thank you again, Dr. Luther, for your kind words. I have had to overlook a lot of words of suspect wisdom. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder why I am so good to you. <laughs> For example, on your 57th birthday, I had a door made for you. In spite of my gift to you, it was called Katerina's door. Details are hard to see, but over the door is the day 1540. The Luther coat of arms and the Luther rose are in relief over two love seats. Christ lives is inscribed with two crosses and one of your favorite Bible verses from Isaiah. In quiet and hope will be my strength. It was a very great door. Thank you again. Well, you became an entrepreneur to feed our ever-growing household. You had a garden that produced vegetables and many medicinal herbs for your medical practice, an orchard, a pig farm, a fish pond, and you also raised cattle and you slaughtered them and had a brewery. And the excess was taken to the market. Someday, someone should make a statue of you in motion. <laughs> Here is the Luther home and headquarters in 1517. And today, as the Luther Museum. This is a candid shot of Martin and Katie 
in front of God's inn. It kinda looks like a selfie. <laughs> we know it's 1540, or as you can see, Katie's F, you can see Katie's door in the background. Look closely and you can also see my favorite pet, Topol. He's right behind us in the, in the background there. Uh, Topol taught me a lot. He's featured in cable talks very often. And he taught me, for example, about prayer. When my puppy dog happened to be at the table, he looked for a morsel from his master and watched with open mouth and motionless eyes. I say, oh, if only I could pray the way this dog watches me. All his thoughts are concentrated on that piece of meat. Otherwise, he has no thought wish or hope. <laughs> For all his affection, we are not sure why Luther named the dog Tupel. Tupel translates as fool or stupid. We can only hope the dog did not understand German. <laughs> I am pleased the city fathers listen to me. I convinced them we should not throw rubbish rubbish or sewage in the city stream on Thursdays. The stream in Wittenberg ran down the middle of the street. It was convenient for the residents to toss out their garbage and sewage, even from second floors. Katie was pleased with the ban, so everyone could draw water on Thursdays to make beer. It's been said that the beer in those days was cloudy. We will not ask why. This is the stream as it runs through Wittenberg. The city restored it for the 500 year anniversary, but now it is several feet below street level. The Luthers were especially devastated at the loss of a daughter. The death of their 13-year-old Magdalena was traumatic for the Luther family. This portrait still hangs in the room where she died. His last words to their daughter were, I love her a lot, but if your will is to take her, I will give her to you with great pleasure. The tired child tenderly and softly answered, Yes, dear father, as God wants. Ah, sweet girl, you will rise again, and you will shine like a star. I am happy in the spirit, but my earthly form is very sad. God grant me and all my loved ones such a death, or rather, such a life. In public, however, no mercy was shown to Martin and me. For example, we were attacked in woodcuts like this one. I am dressed as a nun and surrounded by flies. And the caption reads, there rides Martin with his Katie into the brothel. A Leipzig professor wrote about me. Woe unto you, poor misguided woman. You've been led from holy monastic devotion into a damned and shameful life. You left your convent dressed in lay clothes, like a dancing girl, and went to Wittenberg and cast your eyes on that rascal, Luther, and lived with him in flagrant immorality. Repent your sins like Mary Magdalene. We heard many unkind words, but within our home, we exchanged playful barbs. You reminded everyone that Katie sounds a lot like Keta, or chain. So I soon became your ball and chain. 
That's true, but I also called you my Lord Katie, Mrs. Doctor, Mrs. Doctor Lutheran Morning Star of Wittenberg, gracious Lady of Pig Farm, sweetheart Katie, <laughs> loving and beautiful wife, deeply learned lady, industrious farmer, dearly beloved, my rib, my empress, my true love, and my gift from God. Yes, I know I am a titled woman, according to you, but you also said the woman's place is with the children, the church, and the kitchen. That was not as bad as when you pointed out that women were created with large hips to stay home and sit on them. Oh I might have said that. <laughs> My true love, Dr. Luther, and I suppose I did cross the line a few times, but uh, it was all in good humor. Yeah. I say, seriously, let the wife make the husband glad to come home, and let him make her sorry to see him leave. <laughs> On the other hand, while being fruitful, or more fruitful, perhaps the time will come when a man will take more than one wife. Let the devil believe that. <laughs> like I told you at the time, if you ever picked out another wife, I would have gone back to the convent and left you with all the children and more power to you. No, no my empress, I am well satisfied with one wife and a quiver full of children. <laughs> Luther continued to write, preach, and help to mediate religious and political issues. You know, at my age, Katie, I'm more comfortable at home with you and with the family. In fact, you are better company than my kidney stones, <laughs> my gout, my chest pains, my headaches. My Dr. Luther, you sound like you're going away again. You should not be traveling. And you do not have to respond to every request for help. Yes, I know that, but I have a duty, especially in my hometown of Iceland. And they've asked me to mediate a political issue, and I feel like I must go. Then you must not walk, but take a horse and wagon, as well as our three sons. And promise me not to overdo. Not to overdo? I'm old, weary, worn out, cold, chilly, and half blind. You think I'm going to overdo? <laughs> so goodbye, my dearly beloved Empress. I'll see you soon. And pray that soon does not become never again. Martin would be gone for three weeks. And as usual, he wrote several letters to me, all upbeat with news and gossip. He made no mention of feeling poorly. He was compelled to write and tease me about my tendency to worry. In 1546, Martin wrote to Katie from Iceland. To the Holy Lady, full of worries, Mrs. Catherine Luther, doctor, the lady of the pig farm, <laughs> at Wittenberg, my gracious dear mistress of the house, most holy Mrs. Doctor, I thank you kindly for your great worry, which robs you of sleep. Since you started to worry about me, the fire in my quarters did no harm. And yesterday, no doubt because of the strength of your worries, a stone almost fell on my head, and mortar has been falling down and nearly hit me when I was in the outhouse. <laughs> Pray and let God worry. Cast your burdens on the Lord, and he will sustain you. Just a few days later, Martin Luther died on February 18, 1546, at 62 years of age. I especially regretted not being with my husband when he fell ill. I had been with him and cared for him during his suffering of physical ailments. If only I had been there, I might have saved his life. Or at the very least, I would have been a comfort to him. Later, in a letter I wrote, he gave so much of himself in service 
not only to one town or to one country, but to the whole world. Yes, my sorrow is so deep that no words can express my heartbeat, heartbreak. And it is humanly impossible to understand what state of mind and spirit I am in. I can neither eat nor drink, not even sleep. To help us understand Katie's lack of support after Luther's death, we critique this woodcut. Craddock envisioned the widow Luther in mourning. The prayer book and mourning dress are in character. But the ribbon which covers her mouth is certainly out of place. It suggests that she should no longer speak up. I was consumed by waves of emotion, sorrow, grief, and most of all fear for my livelihood, but especially fear for the well-being of my children. Luther had prepared a will so Katie would inherit everything and would be their children's guardian. But Luther did not like lawyers. So he refused to have his will notarized. Instead, it was witnessed by three pastors. His will was thrown out, and Katie was left without assets. I believed God's sin was meant for both of us, but I was given an eviction notice. I refused to move. I had bought the pig farm, but it was in Martin's name, so I didn't inherit the farm. Let them drag the pigs and me away, and I guarantee you we'll all be squealing. <laughs> I ignored the authorities and was soon managing God's end once again. The elector was considerate and said she could stay, but the elector's chancellor said she had to go. He did not like Katie. He accused her of greed and mismanagement and blocked her purchase of another property. The Chancellor tried to arrange guardians for her and her children. Luther's friends, including Melanchthon, could have been, become her guardians, but they refused. They said, Katie never took their advice when Luther was alive. Why should she take their advice now that Martin was gone? Eventually, the Elector ignored his Chancellor and approved Martin's will. He allowed me to stay in my home and be guardians of my children. In 1546 and 47, I left home twice due to war and returned to find the fields and gardens ravaged and livestock slaughtered. I was destitute. In my desperation, I appealed to officials for financial help in my husband's name, but to no avail. In 1542, the Black Plague forced her out of Wittenberg once again. She took a wagon to Torgau, along with Paul and Marguerite. On the way, the horses were startled. Katie jumped from the wagon to settle the horses, but she fell into a ditch of cold and dirty water. As a result of her injuries, she was semi-conscious the last three months of her life. Although her last words were not documented, Katie allegedly declared she wanted to cling to Christ as a burr on a dress. And on December 20th, 1552, she died at 53 years of age. It would seem to us that she would be buried beside her husband in Wittenberg. Martin Luther is buried beneath the pulpit in the castle church. Katie was buried in Torgau in St. Mary's Church. She was laid to rest there because women were not allowed to be buried in the castle church. Katie served her husband and the Reformation with grace and dignity. But perhaps the final indignity came in her burial, 30 miles from Martin's grave.
Katie's image is on a sanctuary wall marking her burial in St. Mary's. But what about her children, who are seldom mentioned? Hans, the oldest son, was married a year after Katie died. He became a lawyer and worked as a chancellor for a duke in Prussia. He died in 1575 at 49 years. Martin studied theology, but was unable to work as a pastor due to ill health. He married the daughter of Wittenberg's mayor and was 34 when he died. Paul fathered six children, became a highly respected doctor, a professor, a personal physician to two electors. He died at 60 years, and his lineage continued until 1759. Marguerite married a wealthy Prussian nobleman and had nine children in 15 years. She was only 36 when she died. Her descendants include the former German president, on Hindenburg, who ended her lineage. The Luther family heritage may have ended, but we continue to celebrate Martin and Katie's long-lasting impact on our Lutheran family. Most reviews of the Reformation start and end in Wittenberg. We would like to end in Torgau, uh, where Mary, uh, where Katie was buried in St. Mary's Church. It is here in Torgau that the electors uh, built the Hartenfels Castle. Frederick the Wise was born in this castle, and the entire family continued that heritage in this castle. Now, in this church was constructed, or in this castle rather, was constructed a church. And we look, and also the Torgar articles laid the foundation for the Augsburg Confession in this castle. So it does figure prominently uh, in uh, Reformation history. So next slide. This is the church that is in the uh, Hartenfels Castle in Torgau. And I want uh, you just to take note of how different this church is than the churches of the day during Luther's time. Now, some of you have seen uh, Pastor Bill's presentation. Some of you have looked at some of the books. Some of you have traveled there. Some of you have seen the movies. So uh, we'll just take uh, a sample here and say, how is this church different in the Hartenfeld uh, Castle? Just raise your hand and we'll take yours. Yes. Okay, it is very bright, very light. Uh, yes? It has chairs. It has chairs rather than just standing room only. Yes? The pulpit or the lectern is not elevated. It's it's at, I think, yeah. Yes, it's absolutely. It's, it is it's, at, it's chancel, at the level of the people. Chancel level, level of the people. Very true. What else? Yes? We're getting there. Yes? Plain. Yes, mm -hmm. very, very simple, yes. It looks like it has a pipe organ. And it has a pipe organ. Um, if we look at this picture of this church in the Hartenfels Castle, uh, already some things have been mentioned. Look at the altar. The altar is very, very simple. In fact, it's more simple than many of our own altars in our own day. There is no crucifix. If you look at the far left chandelier right behind it, there is a cross. Um, let's see what else. Uh, no icons. No paintings. But there is one very elaborate feature. And that elaborate feature is the pulpit. And it has in relief biblical characters uh, to emphasize the preaching of the word. So we have this, this building, bright, light, no fixtures to speak of. No icons, no crucifix, and it's very, very simple. And so the question is, who do you suppose designed the church? No, it wasn't Katie. You know, she did a lot. But who, who designed the church? Martin Luther. And this became the first Lutheran church. Uh, we would say, and, and also the model for other churches in Germany, although they kind of got away from that because 
because they were so filled with tradition. Uh, the first Lutheran church, we would say Lutheran. In Europe, they would say Protestant. Uh, and more, more likely, they would say evangelical, which they say to this day. Uh, there is no Lutheran church in Germany. There is an evangelical church. Okay. Uh, he was present when this church was uh, consecrated in 1544. And this is part of what Luther said about this church in 1544, which he designed uh, for the uh, elector's castle. It is the intention of this building that nothing else shall happen inside except that our dear Lord shall speak to us through his holy word. And we in turn talk to him through prayer and praise. Poignant words, even for our time and our church. This is most certainly true. If, if you'd like, uh, we'd be more than happy to take a few questions about Katie particularly about Katie. The only caveat is that you ask questions to which I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we've got Martin and Katie here. Um, I'll, I'll run the mic and ask them again. <laughs> well, it's not an ask, it's a tell. Oh, good. I, I think the wedding reception was the very first Lutheran pop.
to take a daughter, only six years old perhaps, to a convent and just leave her there with the intention of not returning. Uh, it, it must have been very, very traumatic for young Katie. Did you ever see your father after you left the convent? No, no. I had an uncle uh, living in the area of um, the, this is the Brenna or Nipshin convent. And I did contact him. But even when I was married, my father and stepmother did not show up wow. at the wedding. They had disowned me. Why did you and the other nuns want to leave the monastery? Uh, you had some information from Martin Luther and some of his writings, but also was there abuse at the monastery? Yeah, they, they were just under guard in the convent. And as Katie says, prisoners. And had no freedoms whatsoever. Leaving was a punishable offense. Uh, they were under uh, Duke George, who kept a tight control, and so it was very oppressive. Even though they learned a lot, it was just very oppressive. And, yeah, go ahead. And Luther felt that when young men entered the monastery and young <laughs> All right, I'll speak have, for no, myself. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, it, it felt that the women did not have uh, any say. And if you didn't have any say um, and, and make this decision and commitment to a life uh, as a nun, um, you shouldn't be held uh, to that. Uh, because it, um, it, it was against the freedom of the will. Yeah. Um, so maybe also part of Audrey's question is, had Martin's writings, I mean, did you, got, you had heard about this, and oh, yeah. so that was what motivated your want to leave, like, oh, right. wow, there's a whole new... Right, the other writing, uh, a track called On Monastic Vows, uh, definitely had an influence on um, both the, the women in, in the convent and the men in the monastery. They didn't feel old, so they had made this commitment. Uh, they were forced into it perhaps at an early age, and um, that wasn't fair, that wasn't right. Yeah, Luther made a very good case that you could give up your vows. That yes. was done under duress. Yep. I'm curious, um, since there were many hymns, I understand, that uh, came out from Luther, how many came as a result of going to what we call taverns? And uh, did, I assume Katie never went. To go to where? Did Katie oh, taverns. go along? Did they? No. 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 Sorry, Katie. I'm really sorry. I, I don't even. But how, Martin, how about how much influence did that set? And, and that I, I don't know. You don't know? Yeah. You don't remember. You hadn't had too much that night. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it has been said in general that many of the hymns during that era used the tunes that were familiar tunes to the people and, and actually uh, sung in taverns and so forth. And they just took those tunes and set them in music. That's, that's the extent of my, my knowledge on that. Yeah. I know sometimes people say that about a mighty fortress. I think I remember hearing something that that might not be the case, but you can. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good, good. Other, uh, we've got Martin and Kate here just for short while longer. Yeah. This has been great. Yeah, I'll make one comment, and that's that uh, with all the volumes of stuff that were kept of, of Luther's, this is kind of the anti-women thing. Only seven or eight or nine uh, letters of Luther. Katie survived. One was the letter that we quoted, uh, writing to her sister-in-law about the loss of Luther. Most of them are just uh, pleas having to do with Martin's death and losing the uh, monastery and so forth. Hers just weren't kept, which is really sad because she was uh, 
you know, very good writer, uh, but the, it just simply weren't kept. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, this has been an absolute delight. I can say that um, the script that you all have written very, just ran out of their words to each other, and I've gotten to know Martin and Katie much better today. And please extend to Don Lang would you come a thank you for 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 We'll continue on with the Reformation next week. We're going to be looking at the issue that Dr. Luther had with um, a guy named Zwingli over the presence of Christ in the Supper and the Marburg Colloquy. You won't want to miss it. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Amen.